Um, we're here with Anthony O'Sullivan, um, so partner and director at White Shield Partners and co-author of the 2021 report. Um, so thank you, Anthony, um, for joining us and, and agreeing to talk in terms of some of the results. Um, I'd like to start um, by asking you overall, what is the significance of the Global Labor Resilience um, you know, report you know, explicitly this year? Um, and its importance, you know, for different global policymakers, whether they be in labor or in other positions. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And I'd like to start by saying that the significance of the Global Labor Resilience Index is first, that we must absolutely look at the quality of jobs and not just the quantity. So looking at the quality jobs and the sustainability of jobs over time. And this has been particularly highlighted in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, which I will refer to maybe a bit uh, later in this, uh, in this interview. Another factor which is extremely important is we can't just rely on a couple of policy dimensions such as labor policy or educational policy when considering the resilience of work. We need to have a multi-dimensional approach which looks both at structural factors such as the diversification of the economy, the demographics in, in, in the country and other important factors which maybe take a longer time to adjust and then shorter term cyclical factors which certainly include educational and labor policies but also need to include technology need to include entrepreneurship need to include a series of other factors which also influence work and ultimately we need to act on all these different levers in, in a holistic manner in order to ensure that we have quality jobs which are sustainable over time. Now, yet another important dimension to the Global Labor Resilience Index is this is not only an analysis, it's also action oriented. And we're looking at various areas where governments can improve in their, in their policies on the cyclical and the structural dimensions, and also highlighting good practices from many governments. So for instance, in the report and in the work we've done in collaboration with the International Labour Organization, uh, we have key uh, good practices such as the Skills Future Initiative of uh, Singapore, which focuses on lifelong learning. Another example would be the Springboard Plus Initiative from Ireland, which emphasizes active labor market policies to support adults to reconvert into new sectors, which might be hit by a particular uh, crisis, or even the longer term thinking DHUB initiative uh, from Germany, which leverages the capabilities of uh, regions in Germany to bring them to another level uh, in terms of digitalization uh, in the financial services sector, in insurance, in logistics, in all of these areas, identifying where they have capabilities in the country and through a centrally funded government initiative, um, offering opportunities to invest in uh, moving up the digital value chain at the regional level. So all of these factors are, are uh, important and highlight uh, why we need a report like the Global Labor Resilience Index. Great. So when you see last year, within the context of 2020, um, with COVID that's obviously disrupted you know, labor markets across the world um, in terms of number of job losses, transitions in terms of work, where do you see actually the relevance of GLRI and its findings um, you know, in, the, in, the, in the COVID you know, world and the post-COVID world? So that's a great question, Tom, because we were all uh, caught off guard, I think with uh, the short term at initially short term crisis of COVID-19 in 2020, which actually became a bit longer term and had very important implications, of course, on overall economies, on society and in, in particular also on, on the jobs of, of people. And I think the key word here is first vulnerability. We saw vulnerability in all uh, dimensions vulnerability uh, for youth who are not able to access uh, jobs uh, anymore, vulnerability for, for women who were sometimes in some of the hardest hit sectors like, uh, like uh, tourism, for instance, or who were also um, more uh, responsible for both working at home and at the same time 
um, working with homeschooling uh, and, and managing these multiple responsibilities. We saw vulnerabilities for the self-employed, which did not have, in many cases for many countries, any protection whatsoever to a case uh, like a crisis like COVID-19 and then the ensuing lockdowns. So fundamental here, and it's been highlighted by this crisis, is the importance of active labor market policies. And, you know, there's many uh, countries that do invest in, in, in active labor market policies. Um, and in particular, one of the reasons the Nordic countries have been so strong in the index, uh, five out of the 10 countries in the top 10 are Nordic, is this um, strong investment in, in, in ALMPs. Um, the average spending for Nordic countries is one to 2% of GDP, which is significant. And that is an investment has, has really paid off as a return because they were ready. They were ready when the crisis uh, hit because that investment had been made uh, way before the crisis. The average spending for OECD countries is about 0.5% of GDP. And yet other countries are, are spending much less. And maybe I would like to highlight here the uh, United States, which is at 0.1% of GDP. Now this is spending, so it's not looking at the actual quality of the uh, active labor market policies, but clearly there was underspending here. And when push came to shove and the crisis uh, hit, it was it was felt that uh, the, that spirit and that investment was not there and those funds could not so suddenly be diverted. So we need to take the bull uh, by the horns uh, here and going forward, learning from this crisis is to have more prevention and more active spending on uh, labor market uh, policies, which are targeted to those uh, vulnerable segments in particular uh, that were that were mentioned. Maybe a second uh, important learning from the crisis and results that come out in the GLRI 2021 are that institutions matter. Institutions matter. And it, many, in many cases, countries were able to put together task forces which brought together different parts of government uh, in order to uh, prepare rapid responses to COVID-19, which were balancing social considerations, economic considerations, and other. And complex decisions were made in relatively short periods of, of time. But the question is, why stop there? And why not institutionalize some of these approaches today? And this is where I think there are opportunities for governments to have permanent rapid response teams, kind of national agenda type approaches that we've seen in the UAE, where you have these kind of 100 day uh, challenges and you're able to solve a number of problems, cross cutting problems, which involve different ministries in a relatively uh, short period uh, of time. Um, so there's no reason why this cannot happen. And we don't need a crisis like COVID-19 to force governments for this to happen short term and then dismantle it. So we would strongly recommend, you know, to take the lessons from, from this um, institutional response that happened for many countries and make it more, more permanent to address a number of other areas um, which need to be tackled in an efficient manner by, by government. So institutionalize those rapid response teams. Um, a third uh, point I want to highlight also on uh, the COVID-19 context is the question of country capabilities, country capabilities in a crisis response. Now, of course, in the methodology of the Global Labour Resilience Index, we do distinguish three types of capabilities, which is absorbing a shock or the ability to absorb a shock. Um, absorbing uh, that shock is, 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 a, is a capability that is associated with some uh, countries more than others, and I'll explain that. Uh, the second is adapting to the shock, which is typically within a one year uh, time frame, one to two years, and then the transformation that can happen. So a third type of capability, and this is longer term. Now, what we found in the GLRI 2021 is that countries are often stronger in one capability and less strong in the other. 
And there is a real need to balance all three. So, for instance, uh, the United States particularly uh, strong on the um, adapting to the shock once it's happened. And we've seen the labor markets in the United States recover relatively well after a big shock. But on the absorption, it was uh, clearly uh, weaker and not ready um, it, for, for a number of reasons. On the other hand, European countries overall were really stronger on the absorption stock with, with all the furlough schemes that were put in, in, in place, but are proving to be a bit slower on the uh, adapting in the adapting phase. Um, the Asian uh, countries were strong on absorption and relatively uh, appear to be relatively strong on the transformation, preparing plans already now for further investment in the green economy and uh, the digital uh, economy. And the Nordic countries, uh, which I highlighted early on, were largely in the top 10, appear to be among the only in the world which are able to balance all three of those capabilities of uh, absorption, adaptation and transformation. So we need to, to learn from this. Um, we need to consider that all three of those capabilities are important. And also to keep in mind that the shock we had with COVID-19 is one of future shocks to come. And we can't treat this as a one-off uh, affair. Even if it's not um, a health crisis, there will be other crises, uh, short-term crises. And so we really need to institutionalize all of these learnings for, for, for governments uh, in order to be better prepared for similar shocks in the future. Thank you, Anthony, for those uh, excellent insights into the GLRI 2021 20, uh, and much appreciated for your time. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>